Kirkes in Bankese jenen So so It's very nice. Oh nee, ik ging het Nederlands doen. Sorry. <laughs> Helemaal van mijn uh, uh, Goedenavond yes. iedereen. Good evening, Heel fijn everybody. om te zien dat er nog altijd um, mensen aan het doen zijn. It's warming to see that uh, the other school people are still arriving and welcome to the School of Resistance, of resistance uh, a project that started out as an online series of debates uh, and which has uh, developed into a symbolic institute where we look for uh, alternatives for the future of our planet. And last week uh, it became even clearer that this future is under attack and we have to show solidarity with everybody who's on the run for uh, war, exploitation, conflict and dictatorship. But let's go beyond solidarity. Solidarity. Let's uh, think about sustainable answers and global citizenship for everybody. Welcome to the School of Resistance. started as an online debate series, and I also welcome everybody watching online right now. But that has, in the meantime, turned into a symbolic institute for the future, exploring alternative visions for our planetary future. Since one week, this future is once more under attack, and we have to show solidarity for everybody seeking refuge from war, conflict, dictatorship, and exploitation. In these two days, uh, we are trying to get beyond the acute solidarity happening right now, which is great, to create and propose solutions for citizenship for everyone. Linking global talks to local practices. Uh, that's what we did uh, the first time last year in Cologne. And we're happy to do so uh, again today from the St. Jacob's Church in uh, Ghent. Uh, like in Cologne, we're not doing this alone. Uh, we can count on the support of um, L'Union des Sans Papiers, Médecins Sans Frontières and Coordination des Sans Papiers. That is what we're trying to do. We did that the first time last year in Cologne and are very happy to continue this journey within the city of Ghent. Like in Cologne, we couldn't do this on our own. 
Nothing of this would have been possible without the support of the strong and engaged people of Ghent Without Borders, in my name, l'Union de Sans Papiers pour la Régularisation and la Coordination des Sans Papiers. Thank you. Kasia and I uh, won't keep you waiting, so uh, let's open the School of Resistance and uh, we'll do so by reading out the Ghent Declaration, a joint uh, effort of these partners to draw the attention of uh, the people of undocumented so aliens in Belgium. let's open the School of Resistance with the announcement of the Ghent Declaration, a joint effort by all partners mentioned before to put the situation of undocumented people living in Belgium center stage. Mensen die we daar voor hebben uitgenodigd zijn nu heel welkom hier bij ons. Uh, uh, we've invited a few people uh, to read out aloud the statement, so please come on to the stage. International freedom of movement has been hailed for almost 30 years as one of the fundamental values of the European Union. For many citizens of the EU, the freedom to travel feel like more just a given. It is an also an absolute necessity, with a passport that opens door to 134 countries, Belgian citizens have the greatest ease of international movement of just about anyone in the world. According to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which Belgium signed in 1948, every human being has the right to work, the right to leave their country, and the right to change nationality. In reality, people from outside the EU come up against an endless series of militarized and bureaucratic borders if they try to exercise those rights in or on the way to Belgium. European policy in which Belgium participates has cost the lives of more than 23,000 people in the Mediterranean Sea since 2014. That figure does not include the people who did not survive an equally dangerous journey across the Sahara. Due to a lack of figures, those who do survive the trip end up in camps where human rights are systemically abused or find themselves entangled in procedures lasting years to be recognized as full citizens. Not having the right papers means being forced to work without documents. It also means that you cannot build a pension rights and that you have no protection from illness or incapacity for work, which means that there is a great likelihood of poor working conditions and exploitation. It creates a reservoir of dirt cheap labor for rogue employers. The undocumented people's legal status means they have no alternative. Uh, 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 I'm going to be uh, here with uh, someone that has left for that, that has lived for seven years without papers uh, and documented. Militants ayant occupé of the containers who occupied the Beginner search in uh, 2021. Uh, 55 worked in bakeries for 5 euro per hour, more than 100 uh, tall and building sites for 4 euro per hour. European Commission buildings in Brussels, the new Kunstwet metro station, and uh, even a police station uh, are just some of the buildings that unacknowledged hands helped to build. Many people are pointing accusing fingers at Qatar, the host of the upcoming Football World Cup. But cheap labour is shamelessly exploited in Belgium as well. This policy of turning a blind eye, excluding, looking up and deporting cost Belgian taxpayers tens of millions of euros per year. 
Regularizing non-acknowledged fellow citizens, on the other hand, would bring 65 million euros per month in extra social security contributions. We have been hearing declarations of intent for clearer regularization policy for years promises of a more human reception. But today, we are going beyond those words. We no longer want to hear from policymakers how terrible the camps in Southern Europe are. We no longer want to hear from Belgium is a welcoming country. Solidarity from the bottom up, which is continually undermined by the legal framework that criminalizes it, is not enough. It's time for collaboration. We resist the mechanism of divide and conquer to build a new, inclusive we that uh, all of us belong to, irrespective of our origins or previous legal stages. All of us can benefit from this unity. Regularization offers a perspective of save and dignified work and guarantees equal rights for those who do not yet have documents. It will enable us to maintain the strength of our social security system and create allies in the struggle to fair working conditions. Regularization also means an end to wasting community money on the criminalization of people through false solutions, such as closed centers and deportations, making us accomplices to human rights abuses. We can invest that money where it is really needed, in healthcare, education, a sustainable transition, and so many other things that will benefit all of us. That is why we are demanding freedom together from the legal framework that have divided us for decades. Because political courage has nothing to do with clutching stubbornly at frigid frameworks made for a different purpose in a different time. Political courage is the courage to keep on questioning those frameworks, to reinvent them and, if necessary, to give them up. We want to change the law by making it clearer and more human, and you can help. We are making a citizen's proposal for a law and demanding an end to random treatment. Clear criteria must be introduced for the regularization process that take into account the impossibility of return to country of origin, long-term attachment to Belgium and certain forms of vulnerability. The appointment of an independent regularization commission made up of people involved in the sector to whom applicants can appeal. They will scrutinize the final decision in the event of appeals after rejection by the Department of Foreign Affairs. The possibility of submitting the application for regularization in Belgium instead of a Belgium diplomatic missions or consular posts abroad as required at present. Stopping the criminalization of people that the state does not recognize as citizens, regularization may not be refused on the ground of undocumented work or infringement related to the migration route. Regularization based on personal projects, migration is wealth. That is why we propose a regularization process based on a personal project. Stopping the criminalization of people that the state does not recognize as citizens. Regularization may not be refused on the grounds of undocumented work or infringement related to the migration route. Regularization based on a personalized project. Migration is wealth. That is why we propose a regularization process based on a personal project. The person will be supported by an advisor who will monitor them during the development of that project. We ask you all to support our project, to sign it as individual or as organization with your friends, uh, family, colleagues, and fellow activists, write Belgian history. You can do that in www.inmyname.be. Here uh, you have uh, a stand where you can sign, uh, uh, and uh, we thank you for your attention.
Goedemiddag dag allemaal. Nu is er blijkbaar een samenzangmomentje voor iedereen. Die nou, er is een moment waar je kunt all join us uh, in chanting. If you feel like it, I think uh, you should have the words there with you. The lyrics, sorry, not the words. Jonas Draven en Sven van Mol. Hoe kan een humaan uh, regulaar... 
Hoe kan een humane regularisatiebeleid er precies uitzien? Can humane regularisation policy look like? What uh, pathway we have to follow and with whom do we have to join forces? We submitted those questions to six experts from six different fields and they uh, submitted a personal reaction and they'll share it uh, with us. And uh, we'll pass the floor to Tariq, Kati, Sinvolders, Ilse Derlin, Hilde, Gerards and Lode van Hecke. What exactly could a more humane regularization policy look like? What steps do we still have to take? How and with whom do we join forces? We ask, the, we ask these questions to six experts coming from different disciplines. They created a reaction to the declaration, which they will share with us now. We give the word to Tariq Chawi, Kati Verstrepen, Sien Wolders, Ilse Derlin, Hilde Gerrards, and Lode van Hecke. Tariq. Well, today it will be the reality of undocumented people here in Belgium. Well, those last year, the authorities had many reforms to restrict the possibility to have legal access in Belgium, so the situation worsened. For undocumented people, 10,000 undocumented people uh, get into a pitfall through those reforms. Those undocumented people, there are about 600,000 in Belgium. They've been for about seven years in the Belgian territory. 75% um, have been here for five years. Most of them have a real uh, connection and relationships. Some of them have even founded a family. Their children uh, attend school with your children. Those undocumented people are your neighbors, your customers, your friends. Uh, they are also in the, in the shops. They pay their invoices and they work for it. And uh, they pay for public transportation, but they have no legal existence. So they depend on unscrupulous employers and uh, uh, and uh, they are misuses or, or they have no legal uh, help. About the uh, work, undocumented people are most of the time concentrated uh, in horeca uh, and building sector, so in hotel, restaurant, and so on. So where they have to work in very dangerous and difficult conditions for a few euro an hour because they are that vulnerable. They're afraid of losing their job. Um, all those people have terribly difficult uh, situation, financial situation. They are abused and sometimes they are even raped and they do not dare to lodge complaints. So it's a kind of modern slavery that they are uh, submitted to. Most of the time, those undocumented people will have a lot of difficulties to find decent lodging. Sometimes they, they do have a lodging, but uh, most of the time it's an un unhealthy one. They don't have a bath, they don't have a shower, or they don't have water. Or, or they can't flush their toilets. And most of them are in uh, houses with humidity problem, no heating or inadequate heating. Sometimes are in institutions about 20 5% of them are in the street, and we can see that in Brussels, in the uh, South Station, or at the uh, Botanic. So, of course, we have uh, 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 the urgent medical card here in, Be in Belgium, but it's sometimes difficult to um, use those rights 
because it depends actually if uh, uh, the CPS, so the central, the centers for uh, supporting people sometimes refuses to do something if those undocumented pe people do not have in an address, uh, a domicile, and that they can't prove where they live. So some undocumented people are afraid to be denounced to the authorities, that the reason why they don't enfin, dare to go to a doctor. Si and then even if the school most of the time accepts registering si their children, even if their parents are in a illegal situation in the territory, their children live uh, in precarity like their parents and they become aware they don't have the same rights as the other children. For example, they can't take part to um, uh, school trips and so on. And uh, when they are 18, after uh, attending school, in Belgium, they get out of the, the normal uh, life, though they have rights. They are instruments uh, to protect them. There is a right to labor, uh, the, the right to uh, good health, the right to a decent uh, uh, lodging. They are violated regularly in Belgium for years. We try and uh, reach the Belgian decision makers to try to find a good and a sustainable solution to their problem. But there are no answers. So the only thing we could do was hang a strike, and it's the reason why. After worth of doing that, of rallies, of meeting decision makers, our collectives, so the Union of Undocumented People for Regularization, or the KBC, or the Coordination of Undocumented People. But unfortunately, the what we negotiated in 2021 to, to suspend the hunger strike, to save the government, were not respected. Even worse, the anchoring elements were used to refuse to regularize some people. The situation of uh, the strikers shows how the administration can be arbitrary and that uh, the current policy is terrible for undocumented people. It does not mean anything for the decision makers. What does Belgium, what do we have to prove to Belgium to have the right to stay and live there? We undocumented people, we live and we work in Belgium. We've been doing so sometime for 30 years, 20 years, 15 years, and we would like to remind you that uh, the notion of uh, uh, being undocumented um, and uh, illegal stay in Belgium is a solution to uh, um, to make sure that we can stay here and we need a structured solution, a human one for all undocumented people that are actually staying in Belgium. And we need to have clear conditions to be registered, anchored in the law, so that we would be able to fight against social dumping, giving rights to workers, Presence on the Belgian territory that have a house, a, a job, and skills to contribute to the economy of the country and that would be ready to pay their taxes. That way, we could solve the, 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 the problem of uh, not having enough uh, workers uh, in uh, Brussels, where there are 130 vacancies, and it's the same in uh, uh, Flanders or in Wallonia, meaning that uh, public service employment in Wallonia 
land in Flanders uh, would need those people if we do not have good regulations. Some uh, employers will go on um, misusing undocumented uh, workers, and as a result, the richer become richer and the poorer, poorer, and regularizing undocumented people would make it possible to, to uh, compensate the number of uh, retiring people. That will be a continuous uh, uh, flow in 2030, and according to uh, to um, the Catholic uh, trade unions regularizing those people um, would mean 75 million more uh, for the social security because the undocumented people cost a lot of uh, money. Ex expelling uh, undocumented people uh, cost about uh, 19,000 euro. So we ask to the politicians to, to stop uh, saying that we are misery, we are no misery, we are a solution because there is a structural lack of, uh, of workers in some sectors. We are added value for society. We are asking the Vivaldi government not to fall in the pitfall of uh, extreme rights and uh, to write down clear conditions like in Italy, in Spain and in France. It would not mean a threat. On the contrary, that way we could fight against social dumping and we could give a right to workers that already live here, our taxpayers, and uh, have a house. And we also uh, ask to uh, the Belgian, the people that can vote, that have uh, documents, to vote for a good migration, to avoid having people that have no rights, that are stigmatized and criminalized. And in that COVID period, contrary to Portugal, Belgium hasn't done anything for undocumented people, so they were in the front line. But they did, they did not give them uh, face masks while they could have uh, supported the economy, helping people, shopping for them, and so on. And as you know, I'm one of the ex striker of the church. In the beginage, And in, in, in February, uh, my friend uh, had to leave the Beguinage. It was an agreement with uh, uh, Father Daniel. Certainly, with this with that hunger strike, we were able to push the political lines, knowing that two political parties, uh, Ecolo and the PS, threatened to leave the government if uh, someone would die, meaning uh, the government is waiting for someone to die to uh, organize organization. I'm looking here at the church, it's the same as in the beginning, you know, it's called here. We went there uh, on the 30th of January uh, 2021. Uh, it was really very cold. I remember the moments uh, we lived there. And I'm asking that you, you Belgian citizens, you can vote so you can, you can have a uh, thing change with the help and with the proposition of Imeinem, you, you can uh, attract uh, media attention so that citizens that are interested in undocumented people could do something. I would like that in a recent future, there would be less undocumented people. But to do so, they have to be regularized, and we need clear criteria 
and Belgians do that. Belgians do the same as in Germany, in Ireland. We heard that Ireland have already started a regularization campaign. Belgium should do the same. Spain has been doing so since 2006. But we need to have criteria to do that. Portugal has already done some Italy too. So I ask uh, the Social Secretary, Mr. Sami Madi, the Prime Minister, Alexander de Croo, the Vice Ministers, they have to react. Thank you. Good evening, teachers and uh, pupils of the School of Resistance, thanks uh, for these kind words, they were quite moving. I'm uh, a legal professional and so I will start with a reference to the uh, legal clauses, Article 9 bis. Uh, uh, first paragraph of the foreigner's law. In exceptional circumstances and on condition that the foreigner has an identity document, the residence permit can be requested from the mayor of the place where he is staying. The mayor shall forward the application to the minister or his authorized representative, and if the minister or his authorized representative grants the permit, the residence permit will be issued in Belgium. And it's on the basis of these articles that uh, the foreigners residing in Belgium without legal residence base themselves for requesting a so-called regularization of their residence situation. It's on the basis of these articles that the state secretary or in practice uh, the aliens office is allowed to grant a residence permit to foreign nationals who are already in Belgium, um, not only to people who had to apply from abroad, but also to people who uh, are not really entitled to a residence permit uh, on any other legal basis. And the powers that these uh, articles confer, confer on the Secretary of State, by extension his administration, are therefore not uh, small. It allows any competent official to decide whether a foreigner can continue his life in Belgium or not. The lack of legally developed criteria makes the decisions taken particularly arbitrary. What are obvious uh, exceptional circumstances for one official are not for another official. It is therefore not surprising that those who, are, uh, who have to rely on this possibility of regularization describe this uh, whole procedure as purely arbitrary. And this feeling of arbitrariness is further reinforced by a total lack of transparency on the part of the competent service. The decision is taken based on a file usually submitted by a lawyer. People uh, are not heard. Uh, they can't contact the official who is treating the, the case file to give any clarification or explanation. And the decisions uh, can, can take months or years to take. And the information based on which the decision has to be taken is often completely outdated. And once the, the decision is taken, there are hardly any legal means to contest it. There's only an appeal in the, the court for foreigners' disputes, but they only have the uh, power to uh, cancel and to declare the decision null and void without hearing the person concerned. The way in which the regularization procedure is currently regulated is therefore far from ideal, but also from the point of view of the minister or his representative, the current arrangement is far from ideal. It really must not be easy for the competent departments of the uh, immigration department to decide which request can be granted and which cannot in the absence of any legal guidance. Moreover, both the current and the previous competent state secretary have already repeatedly stated that they do not want to be the Roman emperor who keeps his thumb up 
or down, but in practice they are. So how can this be improved? That's uh, at stake here tonight. In recent years, it has been decided twice to carry out uh, a general regularization. The first in 1999, the second in 2009. And in both cases, criteria drawn up on the basis of which a decision could be made to regularize, and a regularization committee was installed. Can we learn any lessons from these experiences? First, as to the establishing of the, the, the criteria. Well, as mentioned uh, above, the total lack of criteria leads to legal uncertainty and arbitrariness. A minimum framework therefore seems appropriate. Um, the League for Human Rights, uh, however, uh, doesn't really want to elaborate these criteria too much. It's impossible uh, to, to cover or anticipate all situations that mi might arise. One could consider a number of clearly defined situations in which uh, regularization is certainly possible such as the presence of children who've built up their lives here in Belgium and for the rest. Criteria could be uh, foreseen that differ according to the situation in which the applicants find themselves. But in any case, there should be space for or room for um, special circumstances and allow their regularization. Secondly, the installation of a uh, regularization committee to avoid the politicization of decisions concerning regularization, the authority for the decisions to be taken could be transferred from the State Secretary and his administration to an independent regularization committee. And this committee could take uh, binding decisions after having heard the person concerned and his lawyer, and after having taken note of the file. Uh, this uh, adversarial process thus created would in any case give the person seeking justice a greater sense of involvement. The purely written uh, handling of the case in the current system leads to a great deal of frustration. And there are uh, various ways of composing this committee. Uh, could be a service independent of the cabinet, uh, so independent of politics by analogy with the service responsible for processing applications for international protection, the Office of the Commission General for Refugees and Stateless Persons. And just like the examination of the request uh, for international protection, the request for regularization, could be the subject of an uh, investigation by an official who would hear the person concerned and his counsel and take a decision, takes a decision on the basis of the file. Um, we, there could be uh, something reinstated, such as in 1999 and 2009, the decision being taken by a committee made up of a magistrate, a lawyer, and a an, uh, representative of an NGO. So both approaches have advantages and disadvantages. In any case, it must be clear that the committee to be set up needs decision-making powers and will not be installed solely to advise the State Secretary and his administration. And what is crucial, the person concerned needs to be heard so that the uh, decision can be taken based on up-to-date information and based on all the available information. In cases where children are involved, uh, we need to take into account the higher interest of children. Children should never fall victim or be the victim of decisions taken by their parents. Furthermore, uh, we also need effective legal remedies. Who, uh, whoever gets a negative decision needs to be able to appeal it and make sure that uh, the judge uh, has full authority and can take into account all the uh, ele elements in the case file. Today, in this church, in this house of God, I can only pray together with you that this new reform of uh, alien foreigners' rights can lead to a human main regularization procedure, with or without uh, fixed criteria, doesn't matter, but it needs to be a transparent procedure where there's room for people, where there's uh, room to discuss what's really uh, at stake, and that's what we all hope for, and I'd like to thank the people who've taken the initiative of the School of Resistance. Thank you. Goedenavond, my name is Sien Volders. Good evening, I'm Sien Volders, I'm an author. I work here in Kent. I'm um, 
an advisor for people uh, who are uh, unemployed and homeless. And tonight I come from uh, the eastern cantons, um, a child vomiting in the back seats. I didn't uh, have the time to, to change my clothes and I couldn't even print out my text. So I apologize in advance. And it seems tempting uh, to, uh, to think that it makes it more real, that it, it's better to preach with mud on your shoes. But it doesn't. Uh, and so I uh, address you timidly, because preaching for your own church, that's what I've been wondering and puzzled about for a long time. In 2020, during the first lockdown, there was a period where the inner borders of Europe uh, closed. Nobody could enter, nobody could get out. Uh, those were the days where you couldn't sit on a bench, nobody was out in the streets, uh, unless your, your job was uh, labeled as essential. Or uh, when, due to homelessness, you uh, didn't have your own place to hide in. And everybody without papers, every undocumented person, must have thought that this was the time. Never was there a more delimited mo uh, moment uh, in order to, to uh, carry out a widespread generalization. All the borders were closed. And if, if all the countries had uh, tackled the backlog in the regularization files in, a, let's say, a week or four, that would have been perfect. So they could have started uh, from scratch, but this time without ballast and without delays. And in an ideal world, with a new approach and general consensus. But on this one ideal moment, nothing happened. There was no momentum. There was not even an explicit question submitted. And besides their own parish, nobody felt like preaching. And if we look at the people uh, who uh, ended up in a uh, city shelter, I realized it would have been I realized it was an illusion that the regularization of 1999 changed something in a sustainable manner. It's not just about people on the run and, and undocumented people. Those without rights are not only those uh, who come from outside of Europe, there's also the uh, intra-European uh, foreigners, the, the Bulgarians who grow our vegetables, the Portuguese uh, and the Poles who mend our leaking uh, taps, and uh, the others uh, the, the Hungarians who take care of our um, demented grandmothers. But we consider our, our vegetables, our taps and our grandmothers as ours and those who look uh, after them are forgotten. And the lockdown, during the lockdown it became clear how migration and, and migration labor is part of our economy and how many uh, people without rights are uh, connected to this type of economy on a daily basis. Everything is interconnected. Uh, Brouwers already wrote this, and it's uh, heartwarming to see that uh, it takes a, a general uh, contamination uh, in, a, in a salami factory to uh, illustrate to the general public how um, foreign workers are exploited. We are, our current economy is a giant on uh, weak feet. Clay feet. There's people who are completely invisible unless you pay attention to them. I think that is the strength of this parish um, with the help of writers, artists and actors. Uh, there are no, no better people to convey this message than, uh, this message than those who use information like predators uh, so should um, move out, change the spotlights and also shed some light in the dark. And in dark times there's also always some room for social realist art. Thank you.
Het is vandaag kil in mijn hart. Today my heart's freezing. Oh no, it's not cold in my heart. It's uh, warm heartening, the solidarity with Ukraine. Particularly heartening how you, Rob, maybe for the first time, the directive on receiving refugee uh, respect without the need to apply for asylum. Without thinking, we open our hearts, doors, homes to women and children from Ukraine to those Ukrainian maar refugees. But then my heart freezes again. It feels cold and incomprehension. Why don't we do this for Syrian refugees, so Afghan ones, so Palestinian, Senegalese refugees? The regularization debate takes us at the heart of migration research and refugee studies. I've been conducted research for the past 20 years on psychosocial well-being of various groups of refugees, migrants and people on the move, and more particularly on uh, of unaccompanied refugees, young children and young people who go through the migration process without the protection and support of their parents. As an educator and uh, from a human rights framework, I study well-being of these groups and try to identify the factors that influence this well-being, both in a positive Sense, what helps that, and a negative sense. We already know a lot about these factors from the many studies conducted in recent years. For example, we know that traumatic experience that happened in the country of origin, uh, uh, just like uh, war, persecution, domestic violence, often uh, have a big impact. Moeilijke traumatische ervaringen onderweg. But uh, traumatic experience in, on their way can also have a big uh, a lasting impact. For example, a young Nigerian woman told us uh, in the Child Move Research Project. We didn't have food, just boiled pasta and water, but it wasn't enough. We were around 106 persons in one lorry in the Sahara. The lorry was crowded. Small children and babies were there. The lack of food was very difficult to deal with. On the way to Libya, we did not have food anymore. We had to drink water mixed with diesel, with oil. I saw the traffickers take some girls and ladies to sleep with them. But if you try to stop them, they beat you with a plastic stick. Of zoals deze jongen ons vertelde, oh, we tried a lot to cross the border of Bulgaria. Then we tried a lot to cross the border with Croatia, but always when we were trying, they were catching us. The police beat you and they, they leave the dog to you, that the dog will bite you. And then they will send you back. They will just cross the border back if, If they catch you in Bulgaria, so then they will send you to Turkey. If they catch you in Hungary, so they will send you to Serbia. But in addition to the long-term impact of traumatic experiences in the country of origin or on the road, we also know that there are many stress factors in the countries where refugees and migrants settle. They have an even emotional well-being. The long wait here in Belgium or in another country for documents when they apply for international protection. Or in Greece, as part of the Dublin procedure, they have to wait more for years to be reunited with family in another European country. And they're missing their family. They are separated from their parents, their husbands, their siblings. Procedures that would be faster would be better. But when a procedure uh, means a negative decision, and it's very often this, and it's... Uh, it means that it's in contradiction with the dreams of the people, because most of the time, despite the homesickness and the loss, they really have hope and expectation to build their life here in Belgium. And as a scientist, I must admit, I doubt about clearer criteria for certain procedure would make a difference. 
Oh, they and could the even have negative consequences. Nog wel wat groter, als ik and this stop is even greater as that here the plea to include the, the criterion of vulnerability when assessing the situation. To me, this goes against the principle of human rights and even against the principle of equality. And fairness. In addition to us, uncertain future prospects, there are also the material stress factors, poor housing, irregular income, limited medical care. It was quite clear, I think, from the situation and uh, the story we've heard from people. And uh, there is also the emotional impact of social stress factors, the fact of being repeatedly confronted with experiences of racism and discrimination as a huge impact. Because you feel that we, they don't want me here, or we do not want to have you like you are. But when a limited social network can cause a lot of stress and unhappiness, we find that social support can be extremely valuable. Receiving support, both from professionals and organizations, also from ordinary citizens, volunteers, friends from different backgrounds, neighbors, paths, is particularly valuable for newcomers to our country, or indeed for any human being. As the 16-year-old Cameroon told us, it's her who helps me. Sometimes I go spend a weekend with her and we have a good time. That makes me forget many things. She's like a mother to me, you see? In this quote, in this quote uh, she shows a desire to belong, to belong to this place, to belong here, that she wants to connect, to belong, a desire that is inherent in every human being. And this longing stands in stark contrast to a migration policy whereby we as government and as country want to control who we will or not admit in the country, who is allowed to stay or not, and under which conditions. It always reminds me of beautiful thought of the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, who, in his essay, over hospitality, wondered, what does that mean to be a guest? Who decides the conditions to stay? And how long can someone be a guest? Or in other words, when becomes, when does a guest become a resident? As long as there are conditions imposed on certain groups, we will keep on struggling with the tension between migration policy, its conditions, and the needs, dreams, and desires of newcomers, migrants, refugees, and a lot of other people. It also means that any demand for a more human migration and regularization policy will, will end up in this field of tension. And we shouldn't forget the ultimate touch from which we should never deviate. It should be a universal declaration of human rights. My heart's freezing today. No, not really. It's not cold, it's warm. It's heartwarming to see hospitality, solidarity everywhere in the world. But today here, a solidarity with all the peoples of the world. Moed, zijn mijn moeders. Courage. Is er altijd. My mom said, "It's always there." Als de moed met de D op is, is die met de T er nog. En ik besef dat ik het net heel moeilijk heb gemaakt voor het snoepen. And when when courage is lacking, then duty is the only thing that remains. Maar de moed is er altijd. And it's a play of words in in Dutch, but anyway. Alleen hebben heel veel mensen. So courage is always there. Only. Heel erg veel moed met een T. Undocumented. People uh, have a lot of obligations and, and, and duties because I can imagine that if, if you get stuck in a society without uh, 
any, any perspectives, then en uh, ook courage, jullie medestanders uh, zijn soms and moe. People en who support you also nodig, grow tired. Al niet meer deaf, and they, they, they also need courage. Zelf werk ik voor Orbit. I work for Orbit. Uh, Orbit is een sociaal-culturele beweging. Is en we zijn sinds 1987 uh, actief. In, uh, uh, since 1987. En de levenssituatie We van mensen with, in Orbit uh, and living conditions of uh, undocumented uh, in de aliens. En elk mens and this is about people. Every person has fundamental rights. It doesn't matter whether you're a nice person or not. You simply have them. All you have to do is exist. And those uh, fundamental rights are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Not every person has the right of stay. That is determined by law. That's very hard. How to strike a balance between not granting people, uh, uh, not granting them right of stay, yet recognizing them as people. And within uh, orbit, we were uh, one of the pioneers of, uh, of a church asylum. Then we had the regularization procedure in 1999. I worked at social welfare service. Uh, there was war in the Balkans uh, and people fled. And then there was the regularization of 2009. And I remember organizing the uh, manifestation in, in Antwerp um, on the, uh, the motto, yeah, you have to put your money where your mouth is. Because in 2008, um, everything was, uh, was going fine. And then you can step up uh, the pace. And stepping up the pace in, in this specific circumstances means that we're climbing a hill of first category. And uh, for us, as, as Orbit, this requires a different approach. We have to change, we have to shift gear, make sure that everybody makes it to the top. What uh, Ilse said about uh, the coldness, we, well, we also experience this. There's no Flemish party who currently pleads for regularization. No Flemish party dares to um, come on board. Is erg vergiftig. And uh, the term itself is zijn poisoned. Er ontzettend bang voor. Politicians are afraid of it. Wij merken dat als wij die term uitspreken op een kabinet. We notice that when we uh, use this term in, in a cabinet, lichtpak, then uh, politicians stare at us. That's all they, they seem de to hear, that one toe. word, and then the, the curtains are drawn, and uh, everything is closed. En daarom, everything is shut. Daarom, maar ook omdat we Dat een belangrijk perspectief vinden. Because of that and because of the we think this is an important perspective. We shifted our way of thinking to sustainable future perspectives. We don't want to just uh, discuss regularization as the sole solution. We do want people uh, undocumented or people without a uh, residence permit uh, recognized and are granted uh, a future perspective without establishing beforehand where that future has to lie. And that is why we joined the initiative launched in uh, the Netherlands, BBB Plus, Bread and Accompaniment, and we have a project in Ghent, uh, Shelter and Orientation, ONO, in Dutch, where people are, uh, get uh, shelter, are welcomed and accompanied. It's a two-track approach. Everybody without a residence per permit hopes for papers. But let's be honest, not uh, everybody will get them. And of course, that's very harsh to tell them, and I'm not happy about that either. But we have to convey an honest message. I think that people without papers need to get the peace, quiet and respect to be accompanied uh, psychosocially and medically and find out where their realistic uh, perspectives lie. 
For some of you, it will be here. It is very clear that the Convention on the Rights of the Child, ratified by our country, needs to be complied with. We signed it as a country. It states that the higher interest of the child should be the first consideration in any decision. And currently, that is not true. Orbit uh, always has a legal approach. People uh, without papers have certain rights. There are no labor, the labor rights are not uh, respected. Uh, you need to make uh, able to submit a, a declaration in a safe manner. That's an urgent medical intervention, uh, and it's not up to the government to decide what urgent is, it's up to a medical doctor, and it can be preventive or curative, and some local authorities establish uh, very high thresholds before they, the, those people can exercise their rights. So we want to improve the exercise of those fundamental rights, legally granted, but for whom? Um, Exceptionally high thresholds are also introduced. Legal aid has to be available to everybody. We just heard Cathy. She's uh, one of the uh, uh, alien law uh, lawyers who uh, is uh, very committed. But uh, there's too few of them. Uh, Alien law should be a mandatory subject for every law student. People need to get an explanation why uh, certain decisions have been taken. It's impossible, it's unacceptable why people who've gone through an asylum procedure don't understand why the decision is negative. It has to be explained to them. You have to look together with them what their perspectives are. It can be an appeal. It can be a multiple asylum uh, procedure or request for international protection. And pe the government uh, keeps people in limbo, the non-repatriatability, which is often set up, which is organized. Uh, today I heard that a good friend of mine, an, an Afghan uh, young man, he, he uh, received a negative decision. When you read the motivation of the Commissioner General, well, I could uh, almost weep. <coughs> Currently, people cannot return to Afghanistan. There's not even agreements with the Taliban. What are we organizing within our society? The government has to look uh, at the general interest. And of course, they, they can't give papers to uh, all illegal aliens. But every person, uh, undocumented person, has, is entitled to, uh, to a perspective. People who can't be repatriated. Um, you can't tell them that they have to leave if you know that they can't return. That is why we ask to uh, reintroduce the right to be heard uh, for people, for undocumented people, when they submit a, a request for regularization. We do not advocate fixed criteria in, uh, the, in the law, and I'll explain to you why. If we ask for set criteria, then it will be the, the politicians who will establish those criteria. And beyond those criteria, nothing will be possible because we got what we wanted. Of course, it's not us who will uh, establish those criteria. It will uh, be the politicians. And that's why I asked to reinstate the advisory committee uh, as it used to be, uh, a magistrate, a lawyer, and a person from an NGO, and reinstate the right to be heard. We asked for a, a reform of this um, advisory committee for, uh, and include a youth chamber, um, somebody, including somebody who uh, is well aware of the rights of the child. Those are the main things I would like to share with you today. And uh, I wish you a lot of courage. And if uh, courage finishes, then we'll uh, just uh, carry on the way we can. Thank you for your solidarity. Uh, and never give up.
Goedenavond, beste vrienden. Ik ben Lode, de bischop van Gent. I am uh, Gent's bishop. Ik ben blij te mogen meewerken aan de bekendmaking van de verklaring van Gent. To take part to the Als bishop direction. ben ik bijzonder gevoelig bishop, voor de menselijke problemen. I am particularly problemen. sensitive to human issues. Het lijden en de wanhoop the suffering, die ik met eigen the ogen despair heb kunnen constateren. That I've seen with my own eyes. Maar gaat het niet altijd But isn't omdat mens zijn? Always of because zou het dat niet moeten zijn? Ook in de problematiek van papieren also en documenten. In the question of papers and Het is als je de mensen in de ogen kijkt, When dat you je look de zin in the of eyes, onzin van hun meaning, ziet. Or meaninglessness of their existence. De verklaring sluit aan bij de fundamentele the overtuigingen is in line with the fundamental convictions geloof. of our biblical Christian faith. Niet herhaald in de Bijbel, the Bible repeats, do not forget bent. that you yourself een were a foreigner. Vreemdeling. You were an enslaved foreigner. The Egypt of those distant times remains in the Bible a sad symbol of what's happening today in many countries. A symbol for dus what obviously is part of human beings, something that is part of ourselves, of our own country. We if we waren, forget that we were foreigners, how can we understand those who now live with us as, as we foreigners? If we had not forgotten the exploitation of our ancestors, perhaps we would compromise less with the shameful practices that still exist today. Jesus himself, who is disabled with trying to be, identified with the strangers, the foreigners, every one of them whatever their origin, culture or religion, in the judgment that will be rendered upon us one day that will definitely seal the meaning of our life, he will say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Or the other way around, you did not welcome me. The actualization of this grounding the characterization of this fundamental attitude that must be a characteristic of the Christians is even stronger in the Catholic Church. Its social ethics can more than ever inspire everyone, including our politicians. Texts like Laudato Si or Fratelli Tutti, a revealing title, all brothers, are not only read and studied by Catholics. Pope Francis underlines the seriousness of this not only in his words and writings, but also in his consistent actions. We remember his strong presence and statements during his first papal visits in Lampedusa in 2013 and more recently in Lesbos in December 2021. What he said is still resonating in many minds and concerns that we share here in our own country. It's not only about the Bible or the Pope, which some may consider to be far in the path or far away. The ch church commitment is real here on the field. So when we have it about humanitarian regulation as uh, Caritas International sees it, should be known by everyone. And also think at uh, constant attention action of orbit. And I'm glad that uh, one of the experts, Hilde Gerrit, uh, just took uh, the floor before me. In some cities, organization of church origin work with volunteers for and with undocumented people. The Tinten in Ghent, Vlot in St. Nicholas. They often come together through philosophies of life. 
For example, to a refugee group in Ghent. I also want to honor what some people do on their own small scale, with a special focus on personal relationships in parishes or religious communities. There are even other reasons to associate with partners who aspire, who long for more humanity. I'm happy and grateful that I met Milo. I want to express my admiration for his commitment and the opportunities he has given at the City Theatre, which is our immediate neighbour. That's the reason why I never hesitated for one second when Milo asked me to co-sign. A lot has still to happen on political level for a statement to be effective. From the church, people are invited to cooperate in the direction they follow best according to their personal attitudes, competences and concerns. Conscious. That is what we call in internal pluralism. But as bishop, I underscore the demands of the gospel and the social ethics of the church. No one can remain indifferent, uh, nor can they go in all directions. It remains essential that the human being at the center, is, is at the center, especially human beings in need, in so that they can find that place in our society. Everyone has the right to have a place in the society as long as they subscribe to the fundamental values of our society. I hope that our support will give our politicians the courage to take courageous decisions in the face of emergencies facing so many individuals and families. The urgency of eliminating manifest injustice and providing social security to the people that are sometimes desperately trying to survive. Thank you. Thank you. I know you've been listening for a long time, but there's a lot of important words to say. Um, we do believe, I will not say so much, and um, Eline, you maybe want to translate the short thing we prepared in Dutch, um, because we really want to give the stage to the artists who pre prepared art, um, musicians, um, but also comedians uh, coming here tonight, and we know it's cold, and later there will be tea <laughs> for you to warm up. Um, but I think the most important, is, uh, important part is that um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine already led to one million people fleeing the territory and millions may follow. But the reaction of European member states welcoming these refugees with open arms shows that another migration policy could be possible. A policy for everybody migrating and seeking a new place to call home. To stand in solidarity right now, we also invited Ukrainian voices to our stage today, very short notice. Um, thank you for that. But Eline, please. Uiteraard liggen mijn papieren daar, maar ik ga er niet stiekem om. Um, zoals we allemaal weten, door de inval van Rusland. Uh, as we all know, and, uh, when, when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, about one million people fled last week and uh, probably another million or millions in the coming weeks. Um, EU member states' reactions uh, shows that another regularization policy is possible, a policy where everybody on the run is recognized. That's also one the reason why we uh, want to show solidarity with everybody uh, who's on the run, who left uh, Ukraine. And uh, we're happy to have found some Ukrainian uh, musicians who will perform for you tonight. I would just say that I wanted to read out a letter today by Irina Bondas, uh, who spoke to half a million people in Berlin last Sunday. And um, I think I will just say her last words. Um, and for myself, I just want to say that 
I'm also here speaking today with the memory of my own grandfather, uh, Rom Roman Dimidov, having to leave the city of Lviv in Ukraine at the end of the Second World War, leaving his hometown because of the atrocities of the geopolitical shifts that forced people to move across territories into a new Cold War and after the brutal Nazi regime, he and so many others had to suffer through. I see the pictures of Kiev, and I see my own grandmother, uh, Barbara, uh, being bombed as a young girl in Warsaw, uh, Warsaw. My own grandfather was a Zwangsarbeiter, a forced laborer in the agricultural sector near Hamburg, where I grew up as a daughter of Polish migrants who escaped another regime which called itself socialist until 18, uh, 1989. So, um, thank you, and the last words of Irina, before I give the stage to Hannah. Ukraine will be free if we all realize our own freedom. I beg you, do not leave us alone. Thank you, Irina, for saying this. Good evening, Vitao. Let me introduce Ukraine to you, our strong and brave country, a country with a high culture and beautiful traditions, a country that shares European and human values. Our people are very nice and friendly, and our people sing in every situation, even now. You know, Ukrainian Cossack songs uh, are recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And uh, today, I'm glad to introduce our Ukrainian musicians who work in Belgium. Anastasia Kozhushko, piano. Valeria Peters, soprano. Artyom Shmahailo, cello. And one more thing. This morning, my mother in Ukraine woke up from the bomb. It was an attack at nuclear station nearby city Energodar. We asked the Europeans help us to stop this war. Then tomorrow, your cities will not wake up from the sound of bombs. And we are grateful for your open heart and helping hand. Thanks a lot. And now, time for music. Good evening to everybody. Thank you for being with us today here. We are really grateful that we can be here. We can speak out as musicians with our instruments, fingers, voices. But it's also very important for us that you're here with us to support. We are regretting the reason why we are now here together. Of course, for all Ukrainian people, now life is divided in before and after. Before and after 24th of February, before and after Russian Federation started the war against Ukraine. But I'm not going to speak a lot since I'm a musician. I will speak with the music. But it's very important for me that you hear it out, hear our voices. My family is now in Kharkov, in uh, one of the worst places. Well, I cannot say worse. Uh, we are all, they are all suffering. Now my mother, my grandparents are there. I cannot be there with them. But at least I can ask you, I can ask all the people to support us. To support us with words, with actions. Just to support with love and kindness. I'm going to start with the masterpiece of Tchaikovsky which calls Dumka, which he wrote on the native Ukrainian song. Let the music speak, and I hope for peace and love in this world. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you. 
I will play a piece uh, written by Johann Sebastian Bach for cello solo. Um, this piece was played when Berlin Wall was fallen, which united Europe. And now I wish the same to Europe, to my country, Ukraine, to the entire world, to be united.
Today I'm in Ukrainian traditional clothes and right now I'm going to sing for you a Ukrainian song about love. And at the end of our musical uh, present, uh, we want to sing and play for you Gimn Ukraini, Shenev Merlo Ukraina. If you know the text or melody, please join us. <laughs>
Heel erg bedankt. Nogmaals heel erg bedankt om het Again, mooie thanks a lot for this uh, beautiful musical intermezzo. One last uh, thing, and uh, we're very happy to uh, present to you Shanturu, the peace guru love prince, together with Marius Veres. Uh, we'll, um, uh, he created uh, a moving stand-up comedy show in which he reflects uh, of a life uh, undocumented, as an undocumented person hoping for a better future. Um, is here. Uh, he prepared a touching and humorous stand-up show, comedy. And um, as the peace guru love prince, uh, Shanturu will reflect on Europe telling of the obstacles of an undocumented life and the beauty of hopes and dreams. Ook nog daarna willen and we graag uitnodigen that, voor een gezellig en intiem concert we'll, uh, door de gitarist Sven Mol. We'd like to invite you for a small concert by guitar player Sinda Mol, who we already brought to you Bella Ciao. And next, uh, besides the music, there will also be warm tea. I'm sure you, uh, we all need that. And tomorrow as well, we continue reflecting on possible uh, resistance strategies, three workshops. Uh, Starting uh, at 2 p.m. at Minimeers, there's a few uh, free spaces left. You can uh, find all the information on the website of NT Ghent. And after the workshops, there's a uh, dinner, a long table, many chairs, so feel free to join. And after that, there will be a panel talk about uh, global and local citizenship. And at 9 p.m., we uh, show the movie uh, Samuel, a short movie by Laura Stahl, Dutch uh, movie maker. A cup of tea and a concert by Sven uh, on the guitar. And uh, tomorrow we will go on discussing the strategies of resistance that we started today in workshops by our partners. We are starting at 2 p.m. in Minimeers. Um, there will be a communal dinner in the evening, followed by a panel on global and local citizenship, a poetry performance by Pavana Amiri, and a film screening of the case of Samuel by Lara Stahl. Uh, all the people I mentioned, uh, you can find text by them in our catalog of resistance in the front. So text by Lara Stahl, Tarek Chawi, poems by Pavana Amiri, and many others. There's one by Vandana Shiva. Yeah, you want to say it? Ah ja, misschien nog heel kort. Ik was het Very briefly, in the occasion of this event, we also published a catalogue, uh, the resistance catalogue, with uh, some uh, contributions uh, by people who spoke here today, Tarek Shawi, Mariana Amiri, an Afghan poet who uh, will bring a poetry recital, Lara Stahl. And, uh, and, uh, and so many more. you all to join tomorrow. And now, peace, guru, love, prince.
Und zwar, guten Abend, guten Abend, Kalispera, Punatardes, Malay Wandenangel. My name is Shanturu, you can call me Shanti, and today I'll be Peace Guru, Love Prince. I'm a proto-Dravidian from an island you may recall as Ceylon. And the language I speak is Tamil, a language which is 6,500 years old. A beautiful language, a romantic language. The language is such as a waterfall with rose petals in the pink illumination of the sunset. That's how our language are, is. Meaning, my name has a meaning. It translates to Shanturu is Shanti, that is peace, and Guru, that is teacher. And my last name is Prem Kumar. Prem stands for love and Kumar for Prince. I know our name carries a lot of pressure, but that's okay, my name is fine. I have friends whose names are Shining Protector of the Sunrise Kingdom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Another one is Amazing grace from the heavenly sisters. <laughs> and another one, that's a good one. It's the burning flower with humility and joy. So, I am Peace Guru Love Prince. And, I mean, you have also beautiful names, huh? Belgian names are really beautiful. Like you have Pete, 
Greed, Jan, and Bard. Ah, yeah. Beautiful. Very solid names. No, very good, very good. Well done. You know, I'm Peace Guru Love Prince, and I'm fabulous, as you can see. I survived the apocalypse, and I heard the dear world is coming to an end, and I've come from the future. I've come from the future to teach you how to survive. But how can I do that? I've lived without documents in South India. I had no passport. <laughs> I lived as a Buddhist monk in Nepal. Mm. I have been an indigenous defender in Papua. Ich bin in Deutschland geboren. Ich war zehn Jahre alt in India sonder Papieren. Ich bin ein Klimataktivist. And I have a black belt in Taekwondo. That's my young Padawan, he's learning. So, but before war, I tell you, I don't have much so much time, you know, I have 20 minutes more left and I've already taken most of my time and you know, to tell my whole life and the story, within 20 minutes is not that easy. So I'm going to ask you to all bear with me and before I start, I'm going to start the first piece of information to you all because we're going to start singing, right? And it's beautiful, this church is already divided into two halves. You have hell and you have heaven. And so, heaven goes with me. Ah. Do you want to join me singing? Yeah, so heaven goes. Ah. I don't hear it. One more time. Ah. Good, good. And hell goes. Oh. say and do a lot of things which are controversial and it's going to make you feel a lot of discomfort and whenever you have these tensions building in your body you know you're going to sing is it okay so whenever you feel you know some things i say or i do you're like mm. you're going to tell me it's time to sing okay yeah we can all sing together <sighs> so let's start from the end because I'm already here, isn't it? And I was very, very, very scared to come to a church, especially a Flemish church, because I have this very particular experience in Flanders, very special. So let me tell you the story, what happened. I was in Flanders in a city called Antwerpen, you might know. 
and I was busy trying to find my way. My phone died, and I was like, okay, my phone died, I don't need to go somewhere, and I walk up to this nice lady, and I'm like, excuse me, can I get fragen? And she's like, ich hab kein Geld, ich hab kein Geld. I'm like, no, no, no. I just want to know. I don't need your money. I just wanted to know where I should go. And she takes the umbrella and starts chasing me, and I'm like running. I'm like, no, 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 no. <sighs> and so, <laughs> you understand, I had a lot of fear coming in because I was really afraid of what's going to happen. And I realized this is not just in Antwerp. No, <sighs> we are still in Flanders. And in Flanders, I heard that one in five voted for Vlaams Belang. Oh, okay. So, and one in four or one in three voted for NVA. So that is one, two, three, four fascist. One, two, three, racist. Okay, hmm. I think it's time to sing, isn't it? <laughs> right? I, mean, I think it's time to sing. So let's do the same piece again, right? So. Uh, oh. aren't you? You don't want to kick me out. Fabulous, gorgeous me. Right? Okay. I see already people leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Can I see a raise of hands of those who want to see me deported? Okay. Not bad, not bad. You see, you're not, you're different. You're the good ones. You're not fascists or people who want to destroy the planet with capitalism and, you know, focusing on eternal growth. You don't even slap your kids when they're spoiled. That's ridiculous. You know what? I think it's a pity that you don't slap your kids. Because when I annoyed my parents, I used to get slapped. And, yeah, here the children, they don't get slapped anymore, and they think all oh, this is normal. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that. And you know, I have an eight-year-old kid. His name is Chandran Prem Kumar, so Moon Love Prince. And he's this amazing talent, beautiful, wonderful. But you know, 
you can't slap him. Because if I slap my kid, legally speaking, I would be deported as somebody who's violent, right? And you don't envy you all. Europeans, they can slap their kids and they can, don't get worried about getting deported. And here, I have to respect your conventions so I can integrate myself into your culture. And I try my best. You won't believe, I really try my best. Because my kid has this amazing talent. Somehow the divine talks to him. It talks to him in ways which I don't understand, but he has this message. I work hard. I'm sure if you want to live in Belgium, you need to work very hard. And I work very hard. I have one day a week where I take a break, a chill day, a relaxed day. And what happens? I do what I want to do like every Belgian does, you know, go for a movie, have some vegan fries, and just chill, relax, maybe in a nice spa. And my kid somehow gets this message somewhere, divine message. And Chandran, 6 a.m. in the morning, opens my door, comes in, and like, ah! And I'm like, whoa, where are the killer dolphins? Wasn't the world already ending? And I see, and I, like, I chase him, I get stressed, I go behind him, I chase, I grab. I want to shake him, I raise my hands, and then I say, let's all breathe, right? <sighs> yeah. So unfair. So unfair. Europeans, they are lucky. They can get away with slapping their children. <sighs> if Europeans would get deported, where would they go? Actually, the word deported doesn't make sense now anymore, you know? I think I like the word banished. Right? It sounds more dramatic. <gasps> You're all banished! Sounds good, right? So let's stick with the banish. So let's imagine, where will we send Europeans if you want to banish them? I think the British did this, not Padawan. The British did that, right? Yeah, the British, they send people to Australia. And you know what happened? Genocide. So we can't send Europeans away for all the shit they do. Drinking in public and throwing bottles and burning cars. Colonizing Ceylon and other countries three or four times because they can. And spreading Catholicism. Oops, I'm sorry. Did I say that? I didn't mean that, but you know. Anyway, there's no place to banish Europeans. Maybe we should ask Elon Musk, right? Because he has these rockets. And maybe he would like to have a Banish to the Moon program. He should know about one or two things about colonizing, right? Because his parents being white settlers in South Africa, I'm sure he has some good experience doing that. He can do it in space. To the moon! A whole new world, a new fantastic point of view. No one to tell us no or where to go or tell us that we're only dreaming prisons on moon. It's good money, right? I see a business possibility. Paravan? Send an email to Elon Musk, okay? Good. It's always good to have a young Padawan around you, you know, to get your work done, especially early mornings. So, good money. 
and we can have different possibilities of lives. Speaking about lives, I had many lives. I used to be an engineer, finding ways to fix things and finding solutions. I've organized the first rainbow march for LGBTQI plus people in South India. I used to work in a permaculture farm very early mornings. And I used to be a Buddhist monk. People go there to Kathmandu in Nepal to visit the relic at Bhotanath, and I was there. But actually, I wasn't there for the relic. I was there for the food. Because in exchange of teaching Buddhism, I was getting good food at the Tibetan monasteries. And you know, I was a shitty monk. A real shitty monk. But the food was good, so I continued staying there. And you won't believe, I was a Christian in South India. I didn't believe in God because I used to live on top of a house with no water, sun. We had just one bucket of water every day to wash ourselves. And so I thought God doesn't exist. And then, I'm getting tired, I think I need a chair sooner or later. Maybe I'll sit there. And so one day what happened, I was hungry and my friend invited me to his home, Kevin's mother, and Kevin's mother was so kind. She used to feed me, give me a place to stay, and I didn't know how to repay her. So she said, hey, come to the church. And I was like, sure, I want to went to church. I want to be a good church goer. So I was dressing up well, went to Sunday church, and I saw the chorus singing, the father preaching, and people praying. <sighs> so I sit there, I watch, and I observe what's happening. And then this beautiful woman at her 50s walks up to me, sits next to me, and says, Vanakkam. I could act, I get it from the accent that she was a Tamil person from Ilangai, the same island as me. And we start talking casually about the war, the genocide, the bombings. And then she asks me, are you sad? And I'm like, yeah, I'm sad. And how do you feel? And I start pouring out my heart. I tell her my story. I tell her how it is to be without papers in India. And then she tells me, all your pain can go away. And all you have to say is, I love you, Jesus. And I'm like, okay. I love you, Jesus. And she's like, no, I love you, Jesus. And I'm like, uh-uh. I, 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 I love, love you, Jesus? And he's like, no, I love you, Jesus. And I'm like, okay, I love you, Jesus. And she's like, I love you, Jesus. And I'm like, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And then I became baptized, and I started preaching at the Madras Christian College. I had my guitar had a podium, and then, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was, but you know, the church did not pay my bills. I needed work. I thought God would pay. But, you know, God didn't. But I still did my work, and I was looking for work, and I was hired by Durex as a brand ambassador. And my work was to recruit condom testers. For me, it made sense, right? In the church, we are doing ministries for people with AIDS. It was very logical for me 
if I help people to know how to use condoms and have testers for it, this could be a win-win, right, for both sides. So, one day, I work in this beautiful mall, and suddenly, I, you know, I recruit people for condom testing, and my father from the church, from far away, sees me doing this, and he stares at me. And I could see from the distance that he was piercing through my heart. And you know what happened? I was banished from all the ministries. It was the last day I was allowed to be a Sunday school teacher. <sighs> I know, it was very painful. But deep down, I knew I was still fabulous. <laughs> so, I became an atheist again. And I, can, I know you're looking at me and you're thinking, I'm an ideological junkyard. I'm a woke, non-binary, black, vegan, obviously. I do yoga. I love toxic positivity. <laughs> Who doesn't? And I cry myself to sleep every night. But the point is, all these personas, the monk, the engineer, the climate activist, the preacher, they're all the same person. I am Peace Guru Love Prince. Thank you for this evening. And please, if you haven't signed yet in my name, go for it and sign. Thank you for this time.